right, good evening, church. Man, it's a pleasure to be up here. Um, I'll tell you, I jump at the chance every time uh, you know the pastor asks me or or uh, Miss Betty calls me. I really don't mind coming up here and doing this. If you're ashamed to talk, talk and speak for the Lord, you ought, you ought to not even be walking around, don't you think? All right, so let's get started here tonight. Uh, first, I got to ask you: Did you ever get a gift this year? Did anybody get a gift they really wanted? Yeah. Alright, that's good. Have you ever got a gift that didn't fit? Even if it said one size fits all. You ever got one? I got a hat once. I really wanted a particular ball hat and I got it and by the time I tightened up the back it was like it went to a point and I couldn't even wear it. It looked so stupid. So, uh, But anyway, aren't you glad that you see this book right here? From cover to cover, this is a one size fits all book. Isn't that right? Jesus. From cover to cover in this book right here. Can't beat it. Okay. So now is the question. Uh, the question is, what are we going to do with the new year? And what are we going to do with this free gift that God's given us? To get the salvation. we got a choice. We can either just hold on to it, stick it under that basket, or we can actually get out there and use it, right? Alright, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But uh, just remember, I do want to remind you of this. If you go out and you share God's Word, just remember what it says in, uh, let's see, 2 Timothy 3.12. It says, those that live godly lives shall suffer persecution. Now it says, shall suffer persecution, right? It doesn't say you might. It doesn't say maybe. It says you shall. So uh, just remember that, okay? Sometimes you go out there and, and uh, you share, and sometimes, you know, it comes back we think empty. But anytime you go out there and talk about the Lord, it will never come back void. Isn't that what the Bible says? Okay. All right. As I look around, you know, uh, I don't see anybody that looks like they've been persecuted. Right? So, uh, I'm wondering about that. I'm looking at myself and I haven't been persecuted either, right? Is there anybody out here tonight who has been persecuted for sharing God's faith? For sharing God's love? Anybody? Except for the, probably the missionaries that we know that are overseas. I know uh, the Bruckerts and the Benellis and people like that. They have suffered some persecution. Uh, some of them can't even talk about the Lord except in certain, certain areas they're in in that. So, uh, you know, those people, I really lift them up in prayer on a daily basis. Our missionaries, especially the homegrown ones from this church, uh, they're really incredible people. It takes a special person to give up everything and go to some country that you've never heard of and get out there and, and share God's Word. And uh, a lot of them don't have uh, retirement plans or anything like that. So, you know, God bless them. Okay, so let me shift gears here a little bit. And uh, while I shift gears, I don't know why I'm saying this. This is just something I brought. I, I was thinking about while I was talking there. Um, shifting gears, have any of you guys, when you first learned to drive, were you like me? This was, this was my dad. I wanted to learn how to drive, and my dad says, if you're going to learn to drive, you're going to have to drive a stick shift. Probably most of us here, they had stick shifts. Do you know that 99% of the cars made nowadays are all automatics? 1% are stick shifts. So, but my dad said, you're going to learn to drive. You remember 9th Avenue when it went up that hill right by Cordova Mall? That was the, that, a lot of people can relate to that, right? That's where my dad took me. He said, okay, now you know how to drive. But you're not going to get your license until you can put the clutch in and kind of ride it on that hill. He said, if you can master that, then you can go take the test and get your license. So, you know, I, I practiced and practiced, and sure enough, I could do it. So, I don't even know why I went in that direction about the stick shifting. Uh, I'm a little ADD, so don't worry about it. Yeah. Okay, the title of this message. Let's get to the message. The message is, God orchestrates lives. He knows our sorrows. And guess what? He has compassion. I know it's a long title, but that's the title of this message. All through the Bible, instances of God's directing, directing, influence, sending uh, prophets, a certain men to Israel to get them back on course, or even just to send them back to Him. So we probably don't know. Uh, we probably won't know until we get to heaven how many times our lives, our lives were protected, or directed, or even tested by God. And by the way, if you, in case you don't realize it, God will test you. It says in James, James uh, 1, 2 is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. It says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. If God's not testing you, maybe you ought to look at your life a little bit because maybe you're not on track the way God wants you to be. You guys agree with that? That's a good amen spot there. Amen. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, there you go. Okay, so the scripture tonight, we're going to kind of focus in the book of Exodus, Exodus 2. I'll give you a little background in a little while, but, uh, but it's basically the life of Moses, okay? And uh, what I'm focusing on is, I know that God orchestrated his life, and uh, he definitely went through some sorrows, but mostly I'm talking about compassion. The various people in Moses' life who had compassion on certain things, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, okay? So, we all know the story of Moses, uh, where he, you remember the part where he killed an Egyptian because the Egyptian was uh, whipping, he was a taskmaster, and he was whipping one of the Hebrew slaves, right? And he was just about killing him, and Moses stepped in, grabbed him, fought with him, killed him, and then buried him in the sand. You remember that story? Okay, good. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had someone save your life? Anybody in here? I was hoping Paul Sauls was here because I figured, you know, he was in the military. You have had someone save your life? Jesus saved mine. I would love mine. Okay, there you go. Okay, other than the Lord Jesus, which I am so thankful that he has, but as far as your physical life here on earth, does anybody protected you or saved your... Susan, you have. Yes, I was in a really bad car accident and broke my neck. Mm -hmm. And the young that have had our lives saved here on earth by someone, okay? So, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of this? Oh, you too? Or are you just going like that? Right, don't do that. Don't do that. Now, you're going to, I'm, I'm fixing to tell you here. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Okay. Have you ever heard of this famous person, Sophia Petrillo? Think about it. Sophia Petrillo. Never heard of her? I think you have, okay? How many watch the Golden Girls? All right, now you remember that name? You remember the oldest lady, the old lady? Her name was so, her real name was Estelle Getty, okay? Did you know that she was actually the youngest of all the Golden Girls? They just put makeup on her. It took about 45 minutes and made her look old. And she actually died before any of the others. So, uh, but anyway, the thing I liked about Estelle, I like, or Sophia, every time they had a, a question for Sophia or something and she wanted to tell a story, she always said what? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, she would go, picture this, 1994, back in Sicily or something like that. Well, this is what I want you to do. Picture this, 1994, Jim Gramlich. I'm living in Cantonment, Florida. Just been through a divorce. I didn't want the divorce. It happened. Um, I hate that it happened, but I tried to put things in the lives of my kids because I really wanted my kids to stay busy and not focus on the negative parts of, of all that, right? So I, uh, we had some, quite a bit of property and we would uh, raise different animals. So I asked my son, uh, and I'll get to Moses. Don't you worry, I'll get to Moses, okay? But I asked my son, I said, uh, Michael, uh, what would you like to raise this year for 4-H? And he goes, well, how about some uh, cows, Dad? And I said, well, okay. I said, but you don't normally see cows there. Normally there's steers or something like that. So uh, he goes, okay, that's good. So I tell my son, I said, I'll tell you what, you do some research and you find a breed of cow that you want to raise, and if I can find it, I'll get it for you. So he does some research and uh, he comes up with this breed called a Charlay, C-H-A-R-O-L-A-I-S. And I said, well, tell me about this breed. And he goes, well, they're all white and they're beautiful. And he shows me a picture of it. And I said, okay, you don't see white cows around here. You see Angus, you see Holstein, you see all that stuff, but you don't really see the white ones. So I said, okay. So uh, I talked to the 4-H agent and, uh, and I said, do you know anybody that raises Charlay? And he goes, as a matter of fact, there's a guy in Walnut Hill, an old man, and he's got a whole, uh, a whole herd of them up there. They're all purebred. So I said, great. Uh, he calls him, sees if he'll sell me a couple, and the man goes, yes, I will. So um, I go up there on a Thursday, I think it was, and they had a pretty big production. He had several hundred head, maybe more than that, but they were worming cows that particular day, okay? 
Now you see this drawing up here? This is this is the corral where they did all that. They would run they have a huge pasture here with hundreds of cows and steers and uh, one big bull. And uh, but anyway, they would run about 50 of them in here, close the gate, and then this is a another uh, a way of herding them into a small little area. And then they had a head chute right there. So what I would do is I would stand there and kind of guide the cows in. And then this big guy, he was the foreman of the place. His name was, um, I'm trying to think his name, Carl, I think. But anyway, um, he was big. He was probably 240 pounds, six foot four. And he was the, uh, the foreman of this particular ranch because uh, Mr. King was pretty old and he really couldn't get around anymore. And this foreman was an in-your-face guy. He would like, like that and when you, he told you to do something, you did, you know, I no questions asked. Anyway, look at, make a long story short, this foreman is talking to me and talking to this guy named Bruce, uh, a kid who just started working for him, knew nothing about cows, scared to death of cows. And uh, we're in the middle of this uh, corral right here and we probably got about 50 cows wandering around us and all that and they're kind of skittish. And he points out there, he says, you see that bull out there? And the gate was shut at that time. And uh, we looked at it and he goes, that bull is named Buck. And he said, you stay away from that bull. And it was a Brahma. It wasn't a Charlotte. It was a huge Brahma bull. And it probably weighed 2,500, 3,000 pounds. And he goes, you stay away from that. He said, don't let it in. Don't anything. He said, it's an ex-rodeo bull. And he says, he'll kill you. He will, he will kill you. He said, we don't even like to go out in the pasture around that bull. We get in golf carts that, are, that have sides. And we herd it away because it, it'll attack us. So I said, don't work that. I'm not going out there. So uh, we're in there, and then all of a sudden he tells me what to do. And the big guy, you know, he's smart. He goes outside over there where there's a lever. And he says, run the cows in or the steers in. And he says, I'll catch them with this head shoot when they try to get out. And then he worms them. I'll get to Moses. I'm telling you, I'll get to Moses. Don't worry, okay? So anyway, we're doing that for about, I don't know, a half hour or so, right? And every once in a while, as I'm herding these cows, and Bruce is herding these cows, uh, some of them get skittish and they run by us. Well, when, when it happens to Bruce, he, he like freaks out like a lady. He, he screams like a girl, and he's running for the fence all the time. And I'm looking at him and go, kid, don't, they're not going to hurt you. I said, just put your hands out. Don't worry about it. They're not going to bother you. And he was just scared. So anyway, a lot of them are going by us. Now, this gate right here, you close the gate, and there's a little latch you slide over, and you put a rope around it. Well, what I didn't know was, as some of those cows were coming by, they were jumping and, and banging into each other, and they snapped that handle off. I didn't know it. So now it's just, it's still locked, but it's loose. So when the cows are banging the gate, that thing, that latch is moving over and moving over. So I'm in there, and all of a sudden, Bruce, the kid, he screams and he goes, run, Jimmy, run. And he's jumping over the fence, and I'm going, what's the matter with you? I said, calm down, they're not going to kill you. And he's going like that, pointing. And I turn around, the gate's open, and guess who's standing there? The bull. That bull, Buck, is there. And he, let me tell you something, he's not a happy bull. He's jumping like this, going chomp, chomp. And the ground is actually shaking, no kidding. I can feel the ground. I'm 30 feet from him, and I'm also 30, I'm right here. This is a 4x4. Four 30 feet from there, 30 feet from there, and that bull's right there looking at me. You were going to try to stare him down, did you? No, I did not. <laughs> so I'm starting to shake. I'm getting scared. And I'm thinking, what do I do, right? You know, this bull is, is still, he's starting to get down low, and I can tell he's going to come jumping at me any moment. He's going to gore me. He's got his horns, little half horns and all that. So what do I do, smart Jimmy? You know, i got a lot of brains. That's a four by four. You know, it's about that big around, right? So I'm like this. I'm kind of going, and I get over and on the side of the 4x4, four four and I'm thinking, this is about stupid, you know? And then I got to looking at myself. Now, that bull's out there. You know what he's out there for, right? He's breeding all the cows. Every time a cow comes in heat, he's breeding with them, right? Guess what I'm wearing? A white shirt, light-colored shorts. I kind of look like a real skinny female Charlotte cow, right? And I'm starting to think, and this is about the stupidest thing I've ever done, you know? But I'm standing by that 4x4 four four, hoping that he doesn't think I'm a Charlotte cow, and I'm trying to figure out a way to get out of here without getting killed. So all of a sudden, I think, okay, i got to either make a choice. I'm going to run to the fence, save my life, or I'm going to stand by that 4x4, four four, and he's going to charge it and probably kill me. So, you know, discretion kicks in. I said, it's time to run. 
All of a sudden, when I decide that the bull charges, I run, I take about three steps, and it sounded like a shotgun went off. No kidding. It was like the biggest, loudest bang I've ever heard. I'm still running, I turn around, and the bull's laying on the ground. It's just, I thought it was dead, but it's laying there, his feet are moving a little bit. You know that big guy, Stan? The big guy who weighs 240 pounds? He had a two by four that he was putting under the neck of all those cows when he warmed them. He put this long thing down their throat. He actually had jumped the fence, ran in there, and when the bull ran by me, he hit it in the forehead and knocked it out. Split the four by four, or that two by four was broken in half, and the bull was laying on the ground. He saved my life, literally. So, after I hugged him and thanked him, and, and he actually picked me up by the neck like that, because I was shaking, and carried me over the fence. He just grabbed me by the neck and carried me over the fence. And, uh, you know, I, I thanked him on how many times, but that, that guy saved my life. Why did I tell you this story? Okay, I told you this story because God was not done with me yet. That's all I can figure, right? I don't think that guy did it. I think God put him in the right position, gave him the strength, everything else. God did. God had something more for my life. Guess what? He got something more for your life, too. Isn't that right? Okay, he's not done with you. Okay, let's get to Exodus chapter 2 finally, okay? All right. You remember how I said God orchestrates lives? He knows our sorrows, and he has compassion, okay? So now we're going to start with the story of Moses. Uh, but let me go back a little bit when he was born. And this isn't going to take very long, okay? So when Moses was born, here's what the problem was. The Hebrews were literally reproducing faster than the Egyptians. More Hebrews were being born than Egyptians were being born. The king started to get worried. His advisors are going, you know, those Hebrews, they outnumber us. If we let them keep going, they're going to take us over. And he got scared. So what he said, he says... Uh, Bring the midwives to me. All the Hebrew midwives that nurse or, or, or help birth the Hebrew babies. And he talks to me. He said, I'll tell you what. I'm either going to kill you or you're going to kill the male babies that are born. So they go back and they're panicking and everything else. But they go, you know, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Our God will protect us. And that's what he did. He protected the Hebrew midwives. And he, and he uh, uh, although a lot of babies died, there's no doubt about it. One of them survived, and guess who that was? Moses. That's before he was Moses. I'm sure he had some other name then, right? But here was the problem. Moses' mom raised him for about three months, and then she's, she's starting to panic because a lot of the male babies are being killed, and she says, I've got to do something with him. So she obviously, you know the story, she wraps him up in this basket, puts pitch on it, and puts it in the bulrushes. Don't you think that was orchestrated by God? You know it was. You know it was. She had compassion for her baby. That, that, that's the thing right there, okay? God blessed and protected that baby, okay? So, three months old, mom puts him, uh, the baby in a basket. You know what the King James says that when she saw that baby? She said it was a goodly baby. Now, when you translate what goodly means in the KJV, it can mean two things. It can mean big. Well, obviously it wasn't big because it was a baby. The other thing, it was beautiful in appearance. Kind of like... Chris Larson's mom. You know, when he was born, he was, I'm sure she said, this is a goodly baby, you know? <laughs> but it's just proof right there that just because you're born beautiful in appearance, <laughs> it doesn't mean it always lasts. Now, I'm not saying that about you, Chris, you know, but, uh, but anyway, okay. So, you got a beautiful baby that's born. She wants to save it, so she puts it in the bulrushes, and who do you think wanders down? Pharaoh's daughter, that's right, the princess. She comes down, she sees the basket, hey, she tells her maidens, bring me the basket. They bring it to her. She falls in love with this goodly baby, right? And she decides she's going to raise it, but for a little while she gives it back to the mom she didn't know it was the mom, and the mom raises it, nurses it, all that's a good thing, right? So she had compassion on the baby. She could have said, hey, that boy's supposed to be killed. So there's another compassion, right? The mother had compassion, the... Uh, Princess, thank you. Princess had compassion, and uh, and she names it Moses. Anybody know what the word Moses means? This is kind of cool with the Old Testament. Drawn the, from the water. There you go, drawn from the water. That's what Moses means. That's one of the neat things about the names in the Old Testament. A lot of them, they gave them names, and then they came true later. So they were like prophetic in the way they named things, okay? For instance, okay, uh, if Moses means drawn from the water, you know what Chris Larson means? 
<laughs> How about just the word Chris? Now this is a good as a compliment to you, okay? Do you know what it means? It means a follower of Christ. Now, if that's not prophetic, you think about his mom. She named him Christopher. Christopher, right? When he was born, a follower of Christ. Now look at him. Associate pastor of this church. That's pretty neat, isn't it? So then I said, well, I'm going to go a little farther. If Chris means follower of Christ, what does it mean in some other languages? So I'm looking around and I'm, I'm saying, well, what does it mean in in uh, French and all that? And they all came to about the same thing until I looked up Cherokee. And I wanted to see what does Chris, and that's Q-U-I-S in Cherokee. You know what that means? Shoots himself in the tail with an arrow. <laughs> I'm telling you, look it up. Shoots himself in the tail with an arrow. There you go, Chris. I, now that's some trivia that you might want to verify. <laughs> verify that, okay. That's right. Okay, so Moses, here's what happens to Moses. So now he's, he's part of the Egyptian elite now. He's being raised, and uh, he becomes a very important official in Egypt. So what does he do next? One day he's walking around his kingdom, and he sees two guys fighting. He sees, remember the Egyptian that was whipping the Hebrew? He sees that and he kills the guy. And then he buries him. And he's looking to the left, he's looking to the right. That's what the Bible says. He's making sure nobody saw him do this. He buries him and he thinks he's okay. Now, I don't know how word got out. It might have been from the Hebrew he saved. But I, I can't really say. The Bible doesn't really tell that, okay? But it does say that other people knew about it. So the next day, Moses is walking around again, and he sees two more people fighting, except this time it's two Hebrews. And he goes up there and he goes, hey guys, uh, what are you fighting about? You know, you're both Hebrews. And the one guy looks at him, the guy who's doing all the punch and all the damage, and he says, what's it to you? He says, you're not my judge, you're not my jury. What do you care? And he says, as a matter of fact, what are you going to do to me? Kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Well, now all of a sudden Moses starts panicking because he knows the word's gotten out that he killed an Egyptian. So now he's really scared. And guess what? Just a short time later, the king finds out. And when the king finds out, he's definitely not a happy camper because he's thinking, wait a minute, Moses is a Hebrew. He killed an Egyptian. He's got to die. He's got to die. So he puts the word out, we're going to kill Moses. So what does Moses do? He doesn't have much choice, does he? He's got to run. So that's what he does. Moses panics and he starts to run. By the way, God knew all this. He knew all this was going to happen and he probably orchestrated most of it. I'm not saying God orchestrated the killing of the Egyptian, but I know all that other stuff he orchestrated because now he's working in Moses' life and he's trying to, to teach him some things so that he'll be braver in the future in that. So now you got the mom had compassion, the, the princess had compassion, Moses obviously had compassion over the, uh, the Hebrew that was being beat and all that, right? He didn't have too much compassion on the Egyptian he killed. But anyway, he did have compassion on the, uh, on the, uh, the Hebrew. But he runs. So let's, get, you know, let's fast forward the story here, okay? So he runs to this country and he runs to an area called Midian. And what does he do? He meets his wife, right? He's helping her with the goats and all that, and I guess they fall in love, and uh, he marries her. He becomes a goat farmer and all that, until he goes up on this mountain and sees a bush burning. Remember that? Okay. So we're just kind of fast-forwarding through this. So God tells him what he wants to do. He wants him to go back, and it's about time God says, you know, my people have been suffering. There's a new pharaoh, and he's worse than the other pharaoh. He's beating them even more, making them do a whole lot more work. So finally, God's got compassion now. So we got four types of compassion that have happened so far. And God finally says, that's it. I want you to get my people out of there, right? Well, it wasn't an easy effort to get them out, was it? Moses had to work pretty darn hard. He had to, how many times did he go to Pharaoh? I didn't even count, but it's a bunch of times. There's a lot of plagues that had to be done. And every time the Pharaoh says, yeah, okay, I'm going to let him go, what's he do? Changes his mind, right? He just, over and over, don't we do that? Don't we change our mind? You know, hey, I think I'm going to do this, and then you back off. And then you say you're going to do it, and you back off, you know? My dad always said, let your yes be yes, and your what? No be no. You know, that's what he said. Okay, so uh, after a lot of effort, many miracles, God...
frees the Israelites, they go through the uh, parts of the Red Sea, all that stuff goes on, and now they're wandering for 40 years into the Promised Land eventually, okay? God's showing compassion. All right. It didn't take too long to go through the whole book of Exodus, did it? Okay. All right. So let me finish with this, okay? Most of us, I'm looking around the room here, most of us are probably 50 years, almost 50 years and older, maybe some almost, not, not you guys over there. But anyway, most of us are 50 plus, okay? What I'm asking you guys and telling you guys, let's don't rest. Let's just don't rest on what we've done with our lives. Let's stay busy, right? Let's don't coast through life. You guys remember a man named Patrick McCann? How many of you guys remember Pat McCann? He used to go to this church. He used to be our Sunday school uh, teacher over in uh, whatever our class is called, the old, old farts or something. I don't know what it's called. But, um, but anyway, um, Pat McCann was an awesome, awesome Sunday school teacher. But this is the best thing I ever saw Pat McCann do. Pat McCann was his last days on this earth. He was in hospice. And I went to visit Pat. That man was witnessing to people his last day he was on this earth. Every time somebody walked into his hospital room or his hospice room, he would talk to them about the Lord Jesus and tell them, if you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus, ask him into your heart. It's the greatest thing you can ever do. I know that must have been one heck of a reunion when he took his last breath on this earth and then the next instant he was with the Lord Jesus. You know, that's what I hope I'm doing. I hope when I'm on my deathbed, I'm talking about Jesus and not talking about some stupid accomplishment or something that I've refinished or something like that, you know. I do enough of that how it is, okay? All right. So the story of Moses has compassion woven all through it, just like the Bible has Jesus woven all through it, right? So I'm going to say three things, and I'm done with tonight, okay? Number one, I want you guys to have to think about this next year about have compassion for others. If you're like me, I'll pull up to a major traffic intersection around town. Who do you see on the street corners? Homeless. A lot of homeless people, some homeless, some not, right ever. We can't, you, you can't really know what's what there. But I do know this. I usually think a negative thought when I see them there, like, why don't you get a job, you know? I'm usually kind of a negative, and I'm normally a positive person. But I'm trying to tell myself now, be positive about these guys. Stop the car, pull over and talk to them once in a while because they probably have a story to tell. And it might be an interesting story. It might tell you why they're there in the first place. We don't know what happened to these people's lives, okay? Don't be so hard on them. If anything, pray for them that they'll find the Lord Jesus, okay? Number two, let's take the focus off ourselves this year. It's real easy to say, me, me, me. I want this, I want to do that, whatever, right? Let's, let's put the focus on other things, other people, and get away from us this year. That's number two. And number three, and I think this is the most important, okay? I don't think anybody should ever be ashamed to give their testimony. Isn't that right? Let me tell you something. Every person in this room that's saved got saved in a different manner. I don't care who you are, it was in a different manner. Something was different. It's easy to tell your story. Try to get it down to five minutes, no more than five minutes, and share it with somebody. It's such an easy thing to do. No one can deny your testimony. I don't care who they are. That's the one thing you can tell somebody. You can say, this is how I know the Lord Jesus is real. This is what he did to me, and this is how he came into my life. Don't be ashamed to share it, okay? People will listen. It, you'll be amazed if you say, let me tell you something that happened to me. People want to hear it, usually. And, and even if, if they're not Christians, they'll usually listen to you. With they'll, they'll give you some respect. Take my word for it, okay? That's all I got for you guys tonight, all right? I'm telling you, God is a compassionate God. He's a loving God. If you've got anything in your life, you need prayer or anything like that, come on up here anytime you want at the end of this service. And I would love to pray with you. I got a little book right here. I call it my little green book. That book right there, I probably got how many at home in, in the other room? I don't know, three or four, right? I've been writing prayer requests down in these books for years, and there's nothing greater than to go back through those, those old books and see the stars by answered prayers. It's one of the neatest things in the world. But look on a prayer list where you put a star and see, <laughs> you'll be amazed how many times you forget about things. But if you write them down, 
you can then go back and thank the Lord Jesus for all those answered prayers. Because by George, he's still in the prayer answering business. Guaranteed. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer real quick. Dear Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, thank you for everyone here tonight. Thank you for letting them brave the kind of cold weather. And uh, uh, Lord, I just uh, pray for blessings over everyone in this room. I thank you for um, uh, the McFarlands who are traveling and, and Diana's uh, father-in-law passed away. I just pray you give them safe traveling mercies back here, Lord, because I know the roads are, are very treacherous. Lord, thank you for everyone in this room. Thank you for Pastor Chris, Lord, and for his organizational skills at this church. Thank you for the videographers and all the work they do. They're kind of the unsung heroes of this church here, Lord. And thank you for uh, blessing my life with a beautiful bride, Lord. Lord, I do pray again for blessings, and I thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you.